Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to our final Pi Day of Giving virtual speaker series event, The Case for Small Modular Reactors. As a university community, we're dedicated to increasing our awareness, our understanding and gratitude for the lands that we share. So before we kick off today's presentation, I'd like to acknowledge the lands in which we're gathering today. Our university's campus is situated on the traditional territory of the Mississaugas, a, a branch of the greater Anishinaabe Nation, which includes Algonquin, Ojibwe, Adawa, and Potawatomi. Because everyone is turning in with us remotely across a variety of cities, we really don't want to forgo this important element of reconciliation. So I'd like to ask everyone to take a moment to reflect on the traditional territory that you're on, the treaty that it's covered under, and your own personal relationship with the land. Cowan and I'm the Community Engagement Coordinator here at Ontario Tech University. Thanks so much for joining us today. Today's session wraps up 10 of the amazing talks that we've been hosting with our Ontario Tech experts to share their research and to spread the word about our Pi Day of Giving, which happens to take place this Sunday on March 14th. This will help us raise funds for our Student Relief Fund, which will help students who are experiencing financial need due to COVID-19. Uh, happy to report that we've raised almost $90,000 and we are within reach of our $100,000 goal. So I'd like to thank those of you who did make a gift upon registering for today's session. Now there will be time for Q&As following today's presentation. So please use the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen at any point during the talk to, and we'll do our best to get to them all. These sessions are being recorded and we post it on our website. You can watch them again live, or you can share them with friends who won't be able to make it today. You can also take a peek at the other amazing nine sessions that we've had uh, over the last week and a half. So I'd like to now introduce our speakers for today, Dr. Akira Tokohiro, Dr. Kirk Atkinson, and their student, uh, Megan Tugas-Cook. Hello, thank you so much for joining us. Dr. Akira Tokohiro is the Dean and Professor of the Faculty of Energy Systems and Nuclear Science. Dr. Tokohiro served on the American Nuclear Society's President's Committee following the 2011 Fukushima Daiichi Nuclear Power Plant accident and is an international expert in many aspects of nuclear reactor engineering, design, and safety. He joined our university from New Scale Power in the US following New Scale's completion of their small modular reactor design. Dr. Takahiro's diverse nuclear and energy engineering research interests include small modular reactor and related designs, thermal hydraulics, experiments and measurement, and the modeling of complex systems. Presenting with Dr. Takahiro is Dr. Kirk Atkinson. Dr. Atkinson is a professor and in industrial, industrial research chair in the Faculty of Energy Systems and Nuclear Science, as well as the director of the Center for Small Modular Reactors here at Ontario Tech. Dr. Atkinson is an expert on SMRs in the marine context. He served in the Physics Working Group and Science Support Network for the UK Naval Nuclear Propulsion Program and was part of the team assessing nuclear power options for the future Royal Navy submarines. As naval reactors are the original SMRs, he is one of the very few Canadian academics with real world experience working in a successful program around the design, manufacture, operation and disposal of small pressurized water reactors. And rounding up our group today uh, is Akira and Kirk student, Megan Tugas Cook. Megan is a fourth year nuclear engineering student with a specific interest in the fields of human and organizational factors and supporting the innovation and future deployment of small modular reactors in Canada. Megan has successfully completed co-op terms with Ontario Power Generation and the Canadian Nuclear Safety Commission. Now I'd like to turn it over to these three experts for their presentation, the case for SMRs. So over to you folks. Hi everybody, uh, uh, Happy, uh, good afternoon. Uh, this is our talk on the case for small modular reactors. Uh, you've obviously heard who we are and you've probably seen our abstract, so I won't ramble on about that anymore. So I'll get straight into it. This is not gonna sugarcoat what uh, small modular reactors are, uh, nor is it gonna uh, downplay any other alternative kind of energy uh, technologies that exist. Uh, but let's first of all start off and think about what exactly is a nuclear reactor. So a nuclear reactor is basically uh, a cooker. Yeah. It cooks some kind of uh, fluid and that fluid uh, transfers uh, the, the heat that's generated inside the cooking element uh, to a, some kind of heat exchanger, after which you can then convert it to steam and turn a turbine and make electricity. Sometimes you can take out that steam energy or that heat energy in another way and drive another process. In the case of Canada, we've had a very successful uh, nuclear engineering uh, 
uh, application through the development and, and long-term use of CANDU react reactors. Uh, we see them on the on the on the lakes here in Ontario, uh, and they uh, provide a, a, a substantial amount of power to the to the province. Inside of a reactor, uh, we have nuclear fuel. That nuclear fuel is typically uh, uranium, uranium-235 is the specific kind of isotope that is there. Uh, and it's packaged and you see in a fuel bundle here, this kind of cylindrical thing, there's what we have in a can-do plant. Uh, and they sit within the react, what we call the reactor core. And in the reactor core, uh, fission reactions happen where neutrons hit uranium uh, nuclei, they split uh, and uh, in so doing give out energy, fission products uh, and further neutrons. We have a moderator in the system that uh, slows these neutrons down so they're easier to catch and, uh, and facilitate further fissions. The total amount of fissions we get is what relates to power and obviously also relates to the amount of fission products that are generated and there are wastes. So you can see the kind of circuit, the blue cold coming in, the red uh, uh, hot going out and it goes through this, the heat exchanger and then uh, transfers that energy elsewhere. If you wanted to see a deployment, we see at the bottom here, we see uh, uh, Bruce Power, uh, uh, their station, uh, and you can see the kind of aspects to the plant that is involved. It's quite a big infrastructure, uh, vacuum buildings, reactor halls, turbine halls, transmission towers, all of that kind of stuff. And they're large things. And this, you, if you drive past one of these, uh, you, you can see them from, from a long way away. Now, a lot of people say nuclear reactors, they're unnatural. Well, first off, that's wrong. Yeah. A couple of billion years ago here on Earth, uh, specifically in Africa and probably a few other places, but Africa is the one that's been looked at in a, a place called Oklo, there are natural reactors, actually real reactors that actually had fissions and actually even bred plutonium. Yeah. They were producing power perhaps of megawatts per day uh, and making lots of fission products that are the wastes that people talk about nowadays. We don't seem to be too upset that waste was made naturally. But we do seem to get upset that waste is made uh, in a controlled manner in a reactor plant. Now, why is it we can't see some of these wastes? Well, uh, the very fact is in nuclear reactions, nu in uh, fission reactions, the decay products are radioactive and they decay away. So it's one of the few kind of industries where your waste is actually uh, self-disposing. Yeah. Now, a lot of time we talk about reactors being dangerous. That seems to be what people uh, focus most of their, uh, their interest on. But that's not really true either. And I say not really because there are, you could, you could argue it in a number of different ways. The reality is this is a, a control room of a nuclear station with somebody sitting on a chair, looking at some monitors, watching the thing do its job, which it does very, very reliably uh, for 24 seven, 365, uh, unless you live somewhere like Texas and it doesn't always necessarily work your way. Uh, now, you might even say it's boring. And I'm sure the people that work in nuclear energy don't find it boring. But uh, in terms of looking for uh, explosions, bangs, and all the rest of that kind of stuff that we, we think about, uh, it's not the case. Yeah, This is the perception that a lot of the public has about reactors. And this then ripples its way through uh, our appreciation of nuclear energy. They, they reflect on Chernobyl, especially if, uh, if HBO decides to make a TV show on it. Uh, you know, most of us have seen mushroom clouds, which has nothing to do with react reactors. Uh, we've seen the Terminator. You know, that was what I was interested in when I was younger. Uh, you know, this future nuclear war that's going to happen, where it's got nothing to do with reactors. And then, of course, Fukushima, uh, that Dr. Tokuhiro knows a lot about. Dr. Tokuhiro. Your mic. Yeah, I always forget to uh, meet myself. So thank you, Kirk. Uh, so reactors are safe and uh, we have to deal with the perception that feeds into our fears, uh, designed and operated and regulated properly. Uh, so uh, based on the previous slide and, and, and the text that goes with it, uh, we have to think about uh, in, the, in the former Soviet Union, these were uh, the Chernobyl reactor was a generation two design, uh, early early 60s and early 70s. And uh, there was a human error involved in that accident and poor design. Uh, 
nuclear bombs or atomic bombs or hydrogen bombs, um, nothing to do with reactors. So uh, again, of course, the image and, and, and the horror that's associated really shapes our perception and our fear. And also with the Fukushima reactor, uh, again, generation two designs, we've learned a lot more about the uh, safety in design. And uh, uh, although, uh, well, really no, no uh, workers at Fukushima Daiichi were, were killed as, as from acute radiation exposure during the, the accident that started on, on, on the 11th, right? Uh, we had, of course, uh, 18,000 people die from the, the, essentially, from the tsunami that, that came with the historic earthquake. So let's uh, just think about uh, the lessons that we've learned over the years in terms of the, the old Generation 2 design. We're now in terms of talking about Generation 4 designs. Thank you. So, as uh, Dr. Tokihiro was saying, uh, those accidents that cloud our, our, uh, our confidence in nuclear power are based on designs that came a long time ago when the established regulatory basis that we work under now was maybe not quite as good as it was or they were in places where uh, uh, the politics dictated making certain decisions or in some cases uh, even down to cost decisions. Now these are decisions that can't get made in any kind of uh, Western uh, country uh, with an established regulatory regime. So we've now moved on from this and all the newer kind of reactors that we're making uh, come fall into what we call generation three or beyond generation four kind of designs. Uh, and they have, uh, you know, very, or I say very different characteristics. They have lots of different characteristics that makes them safer. Now, a lot of people would say we don't need nuclear power that wind and solar, they're the way to go. And, you know, I have some sympathy for that, you know, but we've got to get down to the really of the point. Yeah. I took a snapshot from Gridwatch Ontario the other night, and it showed that 50% of Ontario's power was coming from nuclear, about 25% from wind and about 25% from hydro. And few places actually have hydro. We're very lucky here in Canada. In certain provinces, we have lots and lots of hydro resource, but a lot of countries do not have that. Yeah. Thankfully, we see that gas, biofuels, and things like that uh, are very small. And on the right, we see that there is lots and lots of uh, nuclear stations here, uh, and they're actually able to export uh, electricity overseas. Now, if we actually were to look at our carbon intensity, our carbon dioxide emissions, you know, Ontario is amongst the very, very best in the world, the top handful of, uh, of jurisdictions. Yeah. Whereas if you look further across Canada, maybe towards Alberta, uh, you see uh, terrible, uh, terribly high uh, carbon emissions coming out of there because of their different energy mix. Uh, and so all of us, we're all trying to bring this number down. Now, we could say renewables, they're great. But if we actually look at the capacity factors, you look on the on the, on the picture on the, on the left, uh, you can see that uh, whilst big nuclear, and I'm going to call it big nuclear because we haven't talked about small yet, is over 90% uh, up in terms of delivering power to the stated uh, uh, capacity. Uh, wind and solar are much less good, yeah? So wind at 35% and 25% for solar PV. So I'm not saying that they're bad, but we're just saying that they are different. Uh, and as we can see on the right, uh, wind power changes quite frequently with time of the day, time of the year. And sometimes you can go for, you know, I, I lived in the UK a couple of years ago, uh, and we had a period where the wind was basically down to very small for a, a lot of the summer. Uh, it was very warm though, obviously. So if we had a big solar infrastructure, we might be able to capture some of that, but it only shines for a certain number of hours of the day. Then they are inherently intermittent energy sources and they don't make the electricity when we need it. But a lot of people will say, well, we've got enough electricity now. This is an issue for tomorrow. Let's, let's park this and deal with it later. But we can't do that. So the answer is no, you know, a lot of you may have heard of net zero 2050. Yeah, this is the target that nations around the world are trying to hit with respect to reducing uh, the uh, the warm up of, the, of planet Earth, you know, trying to limit the warm up to no more than one and a half degrees Celsius. And what is that for? That's because every time we burn carbon emitting uh, energy sources and carbon dioxide goes out into the atmosphere, we uh, increase the greenhouse effect. We warm up the world. 
Now, if we keep doing that, uh, we're going to find that uh, millions of people are going to lose their homes. You know, there's going to be flooding. There's going to be loss of agriculture. There's going to be loss of species. We can see here on the picture, the polar caps, uh, you know, here above Canada, we can see that how they've melted over the years as the world has warmed up. Yeah. So we need to make a big change and we need to make a step change now. Yeah. If we're going to hit 2050s targets, we need to bring our, uh, our total amount of carbon emissions, our net emissions rather, down to zero by 2050. And the longer we leave it, as we look on the slide to the bottom right, from Extinction Rebellion, uh, these are people that are so committed to this kind of target that they will glue themselves to trains. You know, but we can see the longer we wait, the bigger the hit's going to be, the harder it's going to be to do it. Yeah. So uh, when we look at different energy sources, we can see the total carbon emissions that they kick out. And we see that nuclear is right up there with uh, hydro and wind in terms of emissions. And if we look, solar PV could actually be worse. Now, manufacturing may well bring that down these kind of emissions. Uh, so this is just indicative from one particular source. But what you can see is that burning stuff is bad. So we want to try and avoid burning stuff as much as possible. Now, a lot of people will say that we can reduce our uh, carbon footprint by using electric cars. You know, you know, Elon Musk has made tons of money with Tesla, uh, Bitcoin and everything else. Uh, and he's getting very good at these batteries, you know, with a supercharged battery uh, charging device. Uh, you can charge your battery to uh, within about half an hour uh, and you can go for maybe 500 plus kilometers. And they're really good at this. Yeah, they're really great at this. But the car isn't just the answer. You know, we, we forget that the cars, that power that is taking in has to be generated somewhere else. So we ultimately come back to needing a power source. So we look at it again, solar, if we want to keep the carbon emissions down, solar, wind or nuclear. Okay. Uh, and we've already seen that wind and, uh, and solar are somewhat intermittent. And on top of that, we're going to make this situation worse. You know, anyone here that Pickering is closing down in the next five years or so? You know, Doug Ford obviously did because he extended it for a little bit longer. You know, and that kicks in over three gigawatts of power to Ontario uh, at 90% effectiveness. Uh, and if we're going to try and replace that in the near term, uh, we're going to have to turn to gas. We're not going to be able to do it with, with renewables. So, uh, you know, one of my colleagues gave me uh, some statistics about what this would mean in terms of cost. And the cost in terms of carbon taxes and everything associated with it is likely to be around about two billion bucks uh, per year. And on top of that, we're going to be making global warming worse. So it's all bad. You know, so a lot of people come in and say, OK, with batteries and molten salts and stuff like that, we can store energy for when we need it. Well, perhaps that's true. It may well be true. You know, cryogenic liquid gas storage is real good. You see on the top uh, left there, you see a, a graphic that is indicating the plant that will be in Vermont, I believe it is. Uh, that can do maybe 400 megawatt hours worth of uh, power storage. You know, flywheels are popular for some you know, smaller amounts of power. Thermal uh, molten salts, uh, thermal storage uh, is definitely a growing technology, especially in hot climates where there's lots of sunlight, maybe not so much Canada. Uh, and pumped water storage is the de facto go-to uh, for when you want to, uh, you know, uh, store energy that is made at another time of the day, perhaps through wind, solar, or any other ever means. Now, the problem with, with pumped water storage, whilst it's good, uh, it's a very big infrastructure project. Yeah, that takes a lot of uh, a lot of construction, takes a lot of time, and damages the environment by itself. So some of the times we we damage the environment to supposedly save the environment. Now, of course, energy that's stored, you know, has to come out at some point. And the question is, when's it gonna come out and where? So you can see a graphic on the top right, you can see how load and demand changes depending on times of the day. Uh, and sometimes you can need generation, sometimes you can do it off of battery storage, you know? But if you look at the graphic at the bottom right, you can see where storage devices are in the US. Uh, and you can see a great swathe of the US where there's uh, very little uh, energy storage. Uh, and as we found from Texas a few weeks ago, uh, if you knock out your power for a week or so, and you don't have a, a, a different kind of supply source, uh, you're stuffed for quite a while. You might not even be able to drink water. Uh, so lack of resilience. So that comes into it. Now, the question is, and this comes up sometimes, is if nuclear is so good, you know, we're talking about nuclear here, build another big nuclear power station. You know, perhaps we should. You know, there's a good case for, for saying that. Now, if we look at England, uh, Hinkley Point C has been under construction for a number of years now. 
It was approved in 2016 from a design from some years before that, and hopefully it'll be operational by 2026. Around about similar output to Pickering, but it's going to come in at a cost of around about $38 billion. So that's huge. But if we just looked at the time scale, scale, if we started now, we wouldn't be able to have anything operational by probably the middle of the next decade. So that's no good for our climate targets. So it brings us to what is the hype about SMRs? It's not hype. Yeah. SMRs have been around for a long time. You know, the top left there, we see a submarine. You know, it's effectively got an SMR in it. We see an icebreaker to the top right. We see uh, the bottom right, we see the Mutsu, a nuclear powered ship. And I'm not even going into nuclear power shipping and the advantages here. And the bottom left, you see uh, the USS Enterprise, not the Starship, you know, given my name is Kirk, of course. Uh, it was the first nuclear powered aircraft carrier, you know, uh, went along for really uh, longest time. Uh, so all of these uh, platforms, they all had uh, small nuclear, somewhat modularist reactors. And we've gotten better at making them modular as the years have gone on. Now, there are a lot of contenders in the SMR space. A lot of people coming forward with different designs, different technologies, different concepts. Some are more mature than others. Some are large, some are small. They have different application uh, domains. No. So that's where they fit. SMRs fit in this near-term deployment, generation three plus, generation four world. You know? And it roughly takes about 10 years uh, before we go from design through to maybe license, you know, uh, and this is this is an estimate because you know here in Canada we don't have anything that's been completely licensed yet. Uh, and you know if we went a bit further on from that, a few years before you can put it in a service. So that's the kind of timescale. Thankfully, we've got the designs here, and uh, we see people that are actually uh, viewing today coming in from CNSC uh, in Ottawa that are uh, that are involved uh, with the licensing process and know how far along it's got, and it's got some way, you know. Uh, so what exactly is an SMR? Because I haven't actually said that. Well, the idea is that it's a small reactor. It's just a small reactor. So we talked about big reactors at the beginning. Small reactors, they take up a lot less space. You know, they've got less parts. You know, they typically make less power. Yeah. So let's say less than 300 megawatts electrical. And my case has gone wrong there. Uh, and many are based on previously uh, demonstrated concepts. But what are their advantages? Yeah, well, obviously, apart from zero carbon, you know, we can make them in factories. Uh, they can be built in a few years, you know, they're because the fact that they are smaller, their inventory of radioactive uh, fission products, the things that we worry about in an accident uh, is much reduced because they are smaller by definition. Uh, and so their emergency planning zones go down. Yeah, they have passive safety features. Yeah. Uh, and that is one of their really key things that make them safer. I know these are the kind of things that we think about. All of those kind of safety features, coolant systems, modularity, passive safety, advanced controls, fuel cycle changes, all ways to make us extend lifetime, change the, 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 the demand on components, the chance of failure, to in, make it easier to maintain, make it safer. And when we do all these things, we get better affordability, hopefully, because uh, we haven't built one yet, and that's going to come down to it, uh, better reliability uh, and more flexibility. Dr. Tokihiro, if you'd like to talk about uh, new scale. Yeah, so one of the, uh, what, what's attractive about SMRs is, is the passive safety. And, you know, we, we learn, uh, if you learn anything about human factors engineering, uh, we know that human beings are unpredictable and uh, unreliable in certain situations. So we, we, the safety and design of SMRs is that there's a lot of passive safety elements that if any, anything were to happen, then you can still cool the core. So the new scale approach is one typical design of an SMR and, and many SMR vendors and startups think about passive safety, which really means that uh, there's no human intervention needed for, for long durations of time, the first three days, the first week, the, uh, the first two weeks, that uh, we can take our time in terms of how we manage if there is a, uh, an event or an accident of, and, and, and the point is that you design it so that there can be almost no accident or the accident has to be of uh, a very small probability. So the new scale approach, no pumps, no external power, no external water is needed uh, for long durations of time. And you see on the scale there, the, the first, uh, the first uh, second, the first hour, the first day, 
uh, three days, 30 days, that it's self-sufficient. You can you can just watch it cool down, essentially, and that what that is the essential point about in, the in design is is such that it has all the safety, passive safety elements, so that there doesn't have to be uh, active response to that uh, condition that you may have at the reactor. So thank you. So as we see, the key thing is removing the heat and making sure that the thing doesn't get too hot. Uh, now, uh, a lot of people will say, you cannot build a reactor in a factory. And that's also wrong, yeah? Well, I tell that to Rolls-Royce. Rolls-Royce has been doing it for 60 years in the UK, making submarine reactors. You see their plant there on the, on the right-hand side. That's got multiple facilities in it to make all the components, the core and everything else. And they can turn around reactors in a couple of years, yeah? Uh, or less, depending on the demand, of course. Uh, now, Derby is a city with a population of about 260,000 people. And if you think about the city of Oshawa, it's less than 200,000 people. So it's a similar kind of size of city with an industrial basis. Uh, and people say you can't transport them. Well, if you look at the picture on the bottom left, we, we've been moving around reactors for a long time. You know, So this isn't something that is new either. Uh, so people say nuclear reactors make, a, make lots of waste while wind and solar don't. But that's a little bit disingenuous because if you look here, is this not waste? On the left, we see wind turbine graveyard. You know, these things get replaced every 20, 25 years. Yeah, and they're made of fiberglass and plastics and magnets and all kinds of different stuff. Uh, fiberglass pellets, plastics, things like that. They're real bad for the environment. We're finding plastics in the Mariana Trench at the bottom of the Pacific. Seriously, you know, this is, this is not good for people. You know, we drink it for our drinking water and people worry about radiation. You know, uh, solar farms, they get damaged easily. You know, the panels wear out, they, they break, uh, they need replacement. Uh, they're also thrown to garbage. Now, some of these, especially the earlier ones, uh, contain lots of heavy metals. They're toxic. They cause cancer, you know, just like radiation does. People worry about radiation. Why aren't you worrying about this? You know, Flint, Michigan with their water supply, bad for you. You know, put it into context. Yeah. Nuclear waste. This is what we do with nuclear waste now. We actually look after our waste. We don't just throw it in a dump. You know, we keep it uh, under careful control, under observation, people can't steal it. People can't nick it. It's not getting, you know, exposed to the to the elements and getting into the water table. People worry about that, but it's not what's happening. Yeah, and some of the SMRs that are under development and design and design are actually designed to to burn waste, making the waste problem even smaller. And if you wanted to put it into context, the amount of waste that we have is tiny in comparison to what we burn from, say, coal uh, around the world. So when you put it into context, that's, that makes a fair comparison. So people will say, where are we gonna put an SMR? You know, there's nowhere to put one. You know, well, that's wrong as well. You know, we know that it's under consideration for Darlington uh, in the late 2020s. You know, three designs have been, uh, are under consideration at the moment. You know, uh, General Electric Hitachi's BW, BWR X300, the uh, X Energy's XE100 and Terrestrial Energy's IMSR, you know, all have different characteristics associated with them. Some maybe will take a bit longer to be in service. Some have advantages for higher temperature output for process heat, uh, various different uh, advantages and disadvantages. Of it. And they're under consideration by OPG and others at the moment, you know. And if we look elsewhere in Canada, there's a lot of other places where small SMRs could go to slot in replacements. They're the right size to replace coal-fired power stations, yeah? They can be used far away from, uh, from population centers to drive industry, yeah, the north, you know. Uh, now, not everywhere will need one. Not everywhere is the right fit. Not everywhere will want one. But that's not to say that they shouldn't be considered. Brings us to one of the later points, which is SMRs won't create jobs and prosperity. I think that's wrong too. What do you think, Megan? I think as we see more public and gov government support for some of these smaller SMR venues, you vendors, you can kind of see the correlation between more entry level jobs opening up. We're slowly seeing more of our peers enter these smaller companies as interns or in entry level positions, which is really exciting and something we may not have seen even when I started studying four years ago. Um, as you can see, the global market for SMRs is estimated to be 150 billion by 2024. And you see vendors like New Scale with now with over 300 employees. So when you look at this from a perspective of what really matters to youth, SMRs really present an interesting opportunity to incentivize more youth participation in the industry. 
So the jobs that are going to be in the SMR field kind of check a lot of boxes for youth, and one of them being that they're innovative, they're first of a kind, and that's really appealing. SMRs are going to give my generation the opportunity to feel some of the same satisfaction that those of those who brought kind of the first can-do reactors online so many years ago. So there's also a few other benefits like economic benefits, social benefits, and probably most importantly, the climate benefits that these jobs and these reactors are going to have. So this is something that's going to be abundant and also really rewarding. And for a generation of youth who are really engaged in their world and really wanna advocate for their future, this is something that's gonna be really valuable. Thank you. So, okay, time to wrap up. And obviously I've probably gone over cause I had so much to say. Uh, a few fast facts. Uh, some people are gonna hate nuclear power. No matter what we say here, that's not gonna change their mind. You know, they, just like the people that don't like vaccines, there's people that don't like nuclear power and that's gonna always be the case. So there's no point in arguing with them. But hopefully most of us understand that climate change is a real problem. That's gonna affect tens of millions of people. You know, tens of millions of people. Think about that number, you know. And green solutions are great. I'm all for green solutions. I think hydrogen is a great thing that's gonna hopefully be a major fuel source in the future. But we still need electricity and power to make them. And we don't want to have uh, fossil fuels, you know, muddying that water you know because then we're just making it worse you know so we're happy to make greener choices if they don't affect our quality of life and we're going to need more power not less so if you want to have a quick realistic look you know most of the time smrs are great you know they can be on demand whereas wind and solar can't they can all do co-generation they can all do energy storage they all make waste just be honest about it you know but the waste volume for nuclear is actually pretty small and it's one of those ones where the waste lifetime actually decreases with time. And unlike the other power uh, solutions, uh, the regulation for SMRs uh, and other nuclear power is very high. It's very tightly controlled. So uh, we know that we're safe, but the same can't be said about sticking a, uh, an old solar panel uh, in a local reservoir where you get your drinking water from. I forgot something cost now you're going to say they're really expensive reactors expensive expensive yeah i think that's a red herring yeah what is the cost of uh saving ourselves from global warming you know we look at covid19 we've spent billions of dollars you know a day or so ago you saw uh across the border president biden uh sign into law uh, a 1.9 trillion dollar package of help yeah you know numbers for reactors are tiny when you look at into that What's the cost of turning up late to the climate party? You know, Rolls-Royce suggests their SMR will be something like $3 billion Canadian for 440 megawatts electrical. We've said that Pickering is gonna be $2 billion a year in extra costs because of the fact that we moved to gas perhaps. You know, so we need seven Rolls-Royce plants to match that capacity. In 10 years, we'll have paid it off. Is that a big price to pay? Brings me to the end. So sorry for taking so long. Uh, any questions, we're happy to take them. This has been fantastic. Thanks so much, guys. This is a wealth of information. We've got questions coming in like crazy. And you did actually uh, answer the first one I had about costs. But um, I'm going to actually just pull back to your most recent comment about COVID-19. Has COVID-19 helped demonstrate the need for more power or highlight the issues of power supply as people shift to remote work, remote learning? Uh, we saw issues with broadband. Is this the same with electricity shortage across the province or in the country? What do you think, Kira? I, I would say that, uh, sure, there's been an impact into the nuclear industry, uh, you know, the COVID-19, but remember, we're, 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 my lights have been on and uh, the electricity for my laptop or the desktop and my Wi-Fi, I, I, I can't, it's just been so reliable. I think, I think uh, the nuclear sector, especially, and I think that, I think the nuclear sector in Ontario, especially, that it's been there. It's 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 we haven't it hasn't lost a step in terms of the what they deliver and that's the the primary pro, uh, product is electricity. Kirk, anything to add there? No, I think I think you're right. I mean, you look at uh, uh, you look at the security of supply that we've had here in Ontario, especially, and then you look down to Texas where uh, they had a you know a very different scenario. Now, I'm not blaming any other kind of energy source. There are nuclear stations there too. Uh, but it just shows that when you have a when you have a strong uh, base load capacity, you can weather uh, events that 
you can't necessarily predict. Yeah, you, know, you can't predict the weather, what it's going to do. Uh, and hence, by ensuring that you have reserve to be able to, to deal with those kind of events, I think is very important. Mm -hmm. and you can't do that with, uh, with wind and solar. That's just the fact is that wind and solar, they are, they are intermittent energy sources. So I think we really need uh, a baseload provision. And I think nuclear is it. Yeah, so I, I just want to add, uh, you know, Pickering uh, A, Unit 1, the first reactor that went online and started generating power. You know, they, sell, they just celebrated 50 years. Think about that. 50 years that op reactor has been operating and providing electricity and power for, you know, the economic development. And we have uh, reactors that are operating today. Op, well, that uh, are planned to operate all the way to 2064, right? I mean, talk about the stability and 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 the reliability of the nuclear nuclear power and nuclear sector in Ontario. Uh, that's really something that's uh, you know in this time of great uncertainty, we need something that uh, we can we can wake up in the morning and say it's going to be there. Terrific. You if you look at it too from a jobs perspective, you've consistently seen from the nuclear industry their ability to adapt, especially during the pandemic and keep people in their jobs and keep people working and keep doing it safely. Mm -hmm. um, that brings me to my next question, maybe for you, Megan. What would you say to high school students about the opportunities and consideration um, in considering a field and a career in nuclear or what would be the most interesting part of your study so far? Um, I think I was very lucky when I was in high school because both my parents worked in the nuclear industry, so I was kind of exposed to it, but um, you don't learn a lot about um, nuclear in high school as it is now, but I think as we're seeing it more kind of in the media and in the news, it'll be something that hopefully more high school students will be more interested in. Um, specifically in my studies, I've found the aspect of kind of human performance to be very interesting. Um, in historically in nuclear significant events, we see that 80% of them are due to potentially human error. So I think that's something that I like to look at in my studies is how we can prevent those errors and what we can do within the industry as kind of our reactors are changing and our control rooms are getting a little bit different and more automated. Really, where does the person fit into all of that? Um. I have a question about uh, from the audience about what kind of materials are being considered for SMRs. Is thorium being one of those materials being considered? Did you gentlemen know the answer to that question? Sure, thorium is 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 one another type of fuel compared to uranium. So there is uh, there are already um, you know developments underway to consider to to build a, a large reactor or a small reactor. In this case, a small reactor that can use thorium as the fuel. So it's, it's another option that we have uh, uh, that we can consider. Kirk, any additional comments there? I think that's, that's the point. It is another fuel. So we've found traditionally that uranium-235, which we are lucky here in Canada to have a good supply of, uh, is very good uh, as a nuclear fuel. Uh, but one day in the far future, you know, we might run out of it, or there might be a greater demand of it. It might be harder to extract where there's lots of places around the world where thorium is also available. Uh, so it gives, as Akira is kind of suggesting, uh, an alternative supply. So when people say, oh, you're gonna run out of, nu of nuclear fuel at some point, that's not true. You know, we will just adapt to a slightly different kind of fuel over time, you know, and we have the technologies now to already exploit it. It's just, it's, it's not as necessary given what we already have uh, regulated for and, and, and have working. So we have another part to that kind of question. So uh, one of the panelists, uh, one of the attendees have asked, Canada does not enrich uranium, but most of the newly designed SMRs require enrich uranium at different levels. So how to solve the problem and how to tackle with nuclear proliferation problems associated with the highly enriched uranium uses in these SMRs? Yeah, I mean, hi fine. Yeah. So <laughs> highly, highly, highly enriched uranium is, uh, uh, you know, the kind of, we, we get, head up and confused about what highly enriched uranium really means. Yeah. Natural uranium has 0.7% uranium-235. If I take that up by 0.3 of a percent, up to 1%, that uranium is now enriched. Yeah. It's not really a big deal. What we worry about is weapons. Yeah. And worry about countries being able to have 
uh, nuclear fuels that are enriched to greater than 20%. Yeah, that's why there's a hard limit on that. Internationally agreed hard limits on that. It's why we look at Iran and we kind of get concerns when they get towards that kind of number, you know, and that's what people worry about. But the reactor fuels that uh, we will be using in SMRs, they're not highly enriched fuels. They are enriched fuels, but they're not highly enriched fuels. So first of all, we've got to get that misunderstanding out the way. Uh, a lot of the time, they're already the kind of levels of enrichment that are used in civil nuclear around the world. There's a few exceptions. Now, uh, it is a problem, you could say here in Canada, that uh, we don't have uh, a native enrichment capability. Now, the question is, should we develop one? You know, we do have enriched fuels here in Canada. It's, you know, it's again, disingenuous to say that we don't. You know, there are a small number of university reactors uh, in the country that have enriched fuels. So it's not like it's mm -hmm. not, yeah. Uh, the, 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 the fact is though, that we don't have the current infrastructure to do it, but there are plenty of friendly nations that we already do work with where we can potentially exchange materials on this front. And that's probably where we'd go first. Predominantly mm -hmm. probably the, uh, the US, the UK, maybe France, you know, those mm -hmm. kind of countries, you know, that have a capability already. But there is a case to say that we should have our own capability here, especially if we want to be a big player. You know, mm -hmm. that's a federal kind of decision or uh, as well as a, as a business decision uh, to whether we want to do that. Uh, and it might involve some changes to regulation. Yeah, so it's, I agree with Kirk, what, uh, everything that Kirk said. It's just important to, to say that we have friendly nations that can provide us uh, the enriched fuel or the fuel that would be needed to, to realize the SMR. And that provides Canada time to carefully consider if we want to have an, uh, a uranium or thorium or the nuclear fuel enrichment industry. So we need the time to carefully think about these commitments. But in the meantime, to realize the SMR, we have just across the border, south, you know, south of the border, uh, um, you have a whole industry that can provide uh, uh, enriched uranium fuel for SMRs. So. And if you actually look at the fuel itself, we do the mining here in Canada. We give a lot of the, the actual mineral stuff to other mm -hmm. countries to do enrichment. So if I was to look across the pond where I'm from uh, in the UK, you know, we don't have any uranium mines there. You know, there is some uranium under the, the it would be too expensive to get out, you know. Uh, so we buy it from other places and we enrich it in the UK. So we do already ship nuclear materials around the world already. It's already done, you know. So it's not really any different to say, okay, uh, we ship them our 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 ores, and uh, after processing uh, the uh, the uranium hexafluoride, if it's in that form, and then we send it off for enrichment and get and have it back afterwards. What about using byproducts from existing reactors? Yep, that's we can't certainly can do that. I mean, we that's already been also research. You know, we there is a it's you know really called under the umbrella of recycling. And we have the technology. We know how to do that. So that's another option that we have. Uh, and and for some of the SMR concepts, yeah, as Kirk was saying, uh, contributing to burning the the fuel that uh, the burnt fuel or the spent fuel that we have, or being becoming part of the uh, closing the nuclear fuel cycle. What's called closing the new nuclear fuel cycle. Kirk, anything else? I mean, it's taking away a lot of our problems. I mean, you hear a lot of uh, a lot of politics about where we're going to store the nuclear waste, where we're going to do this stuff, and it it upsets some people. And you know, a lot of people don't really understand what it really means to store. Yeah, uh, but let's say you know the amounts are still very small. But let's say that we could take the uh, the existing spent fuel from a, from a can do plant, and we could use that as fuel in an SMR. That's a powerful argument. Mm -hmm. you know? Uh, to say, okay, we can now take all of that fuel that we saw in the casks that I showed in one of the figures, you know, and then we can actually use the uh, some of the uh, the isotopes in there uh, as as fuel for uh, another reactor. So that's very useful uh, and would reduce the overall waste burden. So it's actually an attractive prospect. So to to the person that says don't build SMRs because we don't like nuclear, we don't want more nuclear materials. Well, the argument goes, well, we can reduce the amount of nuclear materials by having an SMR. So which one do you want? Do you want nu the nuclear waste to stay or do you want us to burn it? Up to you. You can argue one way or the other. 
All right, I've got one more question for you guys, and this one is more for Dr. Tokuhiro. Can nuclear power production be kept safe from natural disasters? Referring to the Fukushima disaster, to expand with the design of a reactor of kind of keep the nuclear reactor safe in case of a natural disaster. I, 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 would, I would think yes. I mean, remember that the, the reactors, uh, many reactors around the world, uh, including the Fukushima Daiichi uh, power station there. There are six reactors there and along the coast there. They all shut down from the earthquake as designed, right? Uh, unfortunately, you know, there were some, and we're, we learned a lot of the lessons. Uh, some of those reactors um, were really right on, right on the beach of the Pacific Ocean. Mm -hmm. And for some of the plants that did survive the tsunami, the tsunami wall was high enough to prevent the water ingress coming into the into the plant site. Unfortunately for Fukushima Daiichi, you know, a historic earthquake, the first ever, I think, of magnitude nine ever in the history of Japan, a country that has earthquakes quite often, um, that in the historically large tsunami uh, did did uh, really destroy the eastern northeastern coast. So. Um, two un improbable events can happen, and we've learning or learning lessons. And we have learned actually the plants that survived were designed well enough, even under that double the earthquake and the tsunami, had engineered well enough with the safety systems so that it survived in perfectly intact in uh, the earthquake and the tsunami. So I would say yes, it can it can be. We, we've learned enough lessons and the industry worldwide has learned enough lessons from the Fukushima Daiichi nuclear plant accident that the plants are they're, they're, the plants are well designed, confirmed to be a good design, and that we're prepared for those kinds of, of improbable emergencies when they do happen. I'll, I'll let me follow that one second. Is that, you know, even the Fukushima Daiichi, uh, you know, uh, event, uh, it wasn't unforeseen. Yeah, mm -hmm. it was predicted. It was a one in a thousand year event. They chose not to have a high enough wall to protect this. The, that was a person's decision, a human factor, as Megan would suggest. You know, that was a decision that was made, uh, and maybe it's a decision down to the regulators in Japan that didn't force them to it, uh, or down to the culture in Japan. You know, uh, it's different to what it is in Canada, or the UK, or the US. You know. Mm -hmm. uh, different ways of thinking. Now, actually, I would say this is where people that are anti-nuclear are important, you know, and I, and I, I want to put it this way, is that they put challenge to companies like OPG. It's like having a one-party politics. Unless you've got an opposition, you can't show you're doing the right thing. Yeah, so you need somebody to oppose. Just oppose fairly, yeah, with fair questions, not made-up nonsense questions. Uh, uh, well, it's, it's, it's a thing, isn't it? A lot of things come out there. Oh, we can do this. Oh, we can do that. But that's not what we're doing. But we can predict this, and we're very good at predicting. Uh, and if you look at very many, the most plants in the world, and, you know, submarines, sea, seaborne platforms, there are many reactors operating in the world and have been for, for decades, very, very safely, very, very reliably. Uh, and nobody says anything about them. You only pick up on, the, on when something goes wrong. And even when you'd see that, the actual radiological consequence because of it is really small. Most of the time, Chernobyl was an, ex an exception. You know, there was a big spread of a uh, uh, fission product around the world. But if you looked at absolute numbers in terms of people dying, it's very hard to say that uh, that lots of people died because of uh, the radiation that was spread. You know, there are radiation in bananas, of course. So people forget. Yeah. That. So just to just to add, this week, you know, uh, March 11th was just the the 10 year anniversary of the Fukushima Daiichi accident, and there have been, been many documentaries. Uh, I watched some of them uh, about Japan and the, and the decontamination of the, the radiation that went outside of the plant. Gosh, in, in just 10 years, they made a tremendous uh, progress uh, in terms of, you know, the forbidden kind of the forbidden zone or the exclusion zone, whatever term that you want to use. But the, that in the 10 years, gosh, the number of 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 areas that now have very low radiation under the international standard, uh, that has tremendously increased. And there are only a few spots 
very near the plant. And, uh, you know, I, I went uh, in October 2011, only about six months after the accident to Japan. And I was only about three or four kilometers north of the plant. I could see the, the, the smokes that the stacks from the plant. Um, but uh, if only in those areas where you're in sight of the plant are still are above the international limit for, for radiation levels that are acceptable for safety. So um, uh, that, at least in, in, the, in the Japanese case, uh, the decontamination and cleaning up of the radiation that went outside the plant, they have made tremendous progress in just 10 years. Terrific. Well, this has been so inspiring and our students in our university is so lucky to have such amazing experts such as yourselves. So thank you so much for joining us today. It was a fantastic way to wrap up our Pi Day of Giving virtual speaker series. So thank you so much. Um, as I mentioned, we are celebrating the infinite possibilities for our students here at Ontario Tech. This year has been difficult for everyone, and although we were able to switch to virtual learning within one day of the declared pandemic, we are really looking forward to getting back on campus with our students soon, but our students still need help more than ever. So I hope that those joining us will make a gift to support our Rude Student Relief Fund, helping students with urgent financial needs that were unexpected due to lost or reduced part-time jobs. All donations will be matched dollar for dollar, like I mentioned, so you really can double the impact of your gift. I'm really pleased to share that we've already given out nearly $400,000 to students in addition to our regular scholarship and bursary program. I would like to give a shout out to Kemp Travel Group who, for, who generously sponsored our entire Pi Day of Giving virtual speaker series. I really do, do hope that you'll join us on Sunday for our virtual Pi Day trivia. You can find more, inter, um, more details on the, on the event at our website at ontariotechu.site.ca backslash Pi Day. Thank you again to our experts for joining us. And thank you. Before we go, I'm just going to leave you with a really quick video from one of our um, energy systems and nuclear science students. So thanks so much, guys. And thanks for joining us. Have a great day. Happy Friday. On March 14th, you can help support our students. And just like Pi, the opportunities for students with a passion are infinite. So join our circle and support higher education.